This morning, we're continuing where we left off last week, talking about fellowship. We started a series about grace, love, and fellowship a long while ago, a couple of weeks ago. We talked about grace and love, and now we're talking about fellowship. And we take our test from the last verse or second Corinthians. So if you turn your Bibles to Second Corinthians, chapter 13 from verse 14. It's a scripture that everybody who has been around any Christian or any Christian gathering would know. And if you're a believer, I'm sure you know this scripture. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So last week, we began to talk about fellowship. Why would the scripture say, let the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you? Because the verse basically is saying, let the grace of the Lord be with you. Let the love of God be with you. And let the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Why would it say for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with us? We need to understand what fellowship is. And so last week we looked at the word fellowship in the Greek. And it is the word koinonia. Amen. It is the word koinonia. And we said the definition of the word koinonia is fellowship. It is association. It is community. It is communion. It is joint participation. Basically, it is partnership. And when you use the word, there are three senses in which you would understand it. You could understand it as the share which one has in anything. So my fellowship is the participation that I bring to anything. So basically, I can understand that this word fellowship is not a one-sided word. It is that you bring your contribution, I bring my contribution, then we can, be, we can say to be in fellowship. You understand what I'm saying? You cannot get married to yourself. There has to be a partner in order to be fellowship. And each of the partners must bring their contribution. So it is two fellows in the same ship. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. It is intercourse. It is intimacy between two partners. It is the gift jointly contributed. So when we put together our collection, it is fellowship. Because we are jointly contributing to do something. Amen. Now when you begin to understand this word, fellowship, in this dimension, you begin to question, what is going on here? So he's saying, let the partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let the participation of the Holy Spirit be with you. That's the word fellowship. So what partnership do I have with the Holy Spirit? What participation do I have with the Holy Spirit? Why is the Holy Spirit seeking to partner with me? I'm mere mortal. He is the Spirit of God. And He is God. Why would He want to partner with me? Amen. And so when you begin to look at that scripture and query it that way, it begins to open up revelations to you. Amen. And so we, we said some very deep things last week, and I'll just repeat some of them for the sake of those who are not here, and then we'll continue from there. But before we began to talk about the fellowship of the Spirit, which our text refers to, we said in the Christian uh, faith, in the Christian work, there can be different kinds of fellowship. So the fellowship with the Spirit, or the fellowship of the spirit that's one type of fellowship that you can experience as a christian and if second corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 is not enough philippians 2 1 tells us that we have the fellowship of the spirit the fellowship with the spirit so there is such a thing as fellowship with the spirit of god and 
We can have fellowship with the Father, that is God the Father. We can have fellowship with the Son, that is Jesus Christ. And you will find that in those scriptures. The, the other kind of fellowship that a believer can have is fellowship with other believers. And that includes everyone. Whether your spouse, your children, other believers, we can have fellowship with other believers. And it is also possible to, for a believer to have fellowship with unbelievers. And then there is that which is called fellowship with devils. It is possible for a believer to have fellowship with devils. Now in this series, as we talk about fellowship, we're actually going to talk about these five different kinds of fellowship and what it means for us. So today, we're really talking about the fellowship with the Spirit or the fellowship of the Spirit. Amen. So why do I have fellowship with the Spirit? In all of those five fellowships, you can put the word partnership, participation. Why would anyone participate with demons? Why would a believer have partnership with demons? Amen. In order to understand fellowship, partnership, communion of the Spirit, we said we have to see the mystery that was hidden in the very beginning. And so last week we looked at those mysteries. We looked at what God hid at the beginning in order to understand why we need to fellowship with the Spirit. And one of the first things that we spoke about is that the earth was made by and belongs to God. Even though that's not a mystery to you, it's a mystery to a lot of people. They think we showed up here by evolution. Nothing suddenly becomes something and then everything came out of that nothing. It's a mystery. But we know, the Bible is authoritative and tells us that the earth, the heavens and the earth were created by God. See, but God gave the legal authority to dominate earth to humans. If you don't know how that is, get the MP3 for last week and listen to it. When God said, let them have dominion, he gave the dominion, the legal authority to dominate earth to us, to humans. All right? So man became the legal steward of earth's domain. And man is still the legal steward of earth's domain. Because God did not change his mind about that. Praise God. Please say to your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. this earth belongs to us. If you don't believe me, read Psalm 115 verse 15 and 16. It says the heavens belong to the Lord and the earth he has given to the who? Sons of men, humans. This earth belongs to us. You are the legal steward of earth's domain. Praise God. Both physically and spiritually. You know, that's why I like environmentalists, okay? Praise God. Because they are trying to protect the earth. Because they have an understanding that we are stewards of the earth. We are. Whatever happens to this earth kind of depends on us. Now, the spiritual part of this is that only spirits in a human body, that is a human's body, a death body, is legal on earth. We explained this last week and I kind of tried to prove it. A spirit that is not inhabiting a human body is not legal on earth. Because when God made man, he made man to have dominion on earth. That is why once you lose your body, you are no longer legal on earth. You got to go. Praise God. Amen. Amen. However, Satan wants to take over the earth. He wants to take over the dominion of the earth. Demonic spirits wants to have influence on the earth. That's why demons seek to enter human bodies. Why, why would a demon want to inhabit your body? If not for this reason. Demons have no legal right on the earth except they inhabit a human body. And that's why people become possessed. Because they could have stayed in all of the trees and all of the goats and all the other animals and not care about humans. 
But the reason why demonic spirits have affinity for human bodies to inhabit it is because they know that if I'm not in a human body, I am not legal on earth. Dominion of the earth has been given to man. Therefore, if a demon inhabits a human body, he can control the man and do things on the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. Now, the next thing we said was that any spirit without a human body is illegal on earth. And that includes God's spirit himself. Why? Because God will not break his own word. When he gave the dominion of the earth to man, he did not include himself. He said, let them have dominion, right? Amen. Let them subdue the earth, right? Let them be fruitful and multiply. Heaven was his dominion. He gave us the right, the privilege to dominate earth. So his spirit will be illegal on earth if there is no human participation and partnership with his spirit. Are you following me? Do you understand where we're going to and where we're coming from? So any kind of supernatural influence on earth is only legal through the participation and partnership of a human being. So whatever Satan is doing on the earth is illegal. Satan, the Bible says he's a liar from the beginning. He doesn't, he has no honor on his word. He can break his word and do whatever he likes. So he demonic spirit and lock them up in hell forever and ever. See, that's why we have hell. Praise God there is hell fire. Amen, amen. Because it was not created for man. The earth was made for man. Hell was made for all of these illegal spirits that are operating in the earth today. They had better be in hell. Otherwise, we're all going to be living in hell on earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So it makes sense for there to be a hell. Hallelujah. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Now, by these principles, in order for God's spirit to have influence on the earth, he needs partnership, participation, fellowship with a human being. Praise God. And then we kind of said through the partnership of the serpent, Eve, and Adam, Satan stole that authority from man. That authority to dominate, to subdue the earth, to be the boss on earth, on behalf of God. Because the Bible says, whosoever you obey to that person, you are a slave. So by obeying the devil and disobeying God, in the beginning, man became subject and slave to Satan. And he could rule. But his lease has run out. Amen. Amen. Because Jesus came. God through partnership with another human called Mary, came into human domain legally to restore that authority. And that is why this mystery, the Bible says, was hidden from the beginning. Because at the very beginning, God said, your seed to the woman is going to give me a body and I'm going to come and crush the head of this serpent. Amen. 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 It is a mystery. And the Bible says, if the rulers of this world had known, uh -huh. they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So God, in human body, came down to save us. But Jesus did not complete all that needed to be done. He told us, I am going to go to the Father, and when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit, another one of the same kind. He will come and continue the work. But he is going to need you. He is going to come into partnership with you. He is going to come upon you and he's going to be in you. And because I go to the Father, greater works than these shall you what? Do. So the coming of the Holy Spirit, his partnership with us, is to continue the work that Jesus started. Amen. Amen. And to finish it. The work of salvation was completely finished on the cross. 
But in order for that work to become relevant, to become applied to the lives of those who will come after him, he sent his spirit. Amen. Amen. Therefore, fellowship and partnership or participation or communion with the Holy Spirit is crucial. It is crucial for every believer. Because man, humans, we need to give God permission to interfere in the affairs of the earth. In order for God to walk in this world and to walk in this world, we have to participate with him. In fact, God has never done anything on earth except there was a man or a woman who would cooperate with him. Have you realized that? Amen. Go and check it. In everything God has done from Genesis to Revelation, he has never done anything on earth except there was a man who was willing to obey, to believe him, and to cooperate with him. Amen. Did you think God could not just make an act appear when he sent the flood? Could have. Could have just, okay, act, you, go in. I'm sending rain. Done. But that would be illegal. And God does not break his own word. So he needed to come to Noah and say, Noah, I'm sending the flood. And Noah had to believe and build the ark. And by doing so, Noah condemned the word. You know, it was Noah that condemned the word. Yes. It was Noah that brought the flood. Yes. He was like, I'm preaching. I'm telling you guys now. God is going to send rain. And they were like, there's not been such thing as rain. How is it going to happen? Well, I'm telling you. And so by the permission of Noah, God could do what he did. Look at it. Any story in the Bible, anywhere God has done anything, he needed the cooperation of a human being. The one that amazed me the most in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, God was going to do stuff. And then he said, can I hide this thing from Abraham, my friend? This thing that I want to do. And so he went to Abraham. You, you know what? I'm trying to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I need your permission to do it. And the guy said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to give you my permission. If you find 50 people, would you do it? Oh, if you find 50 people, of course, deal done, I'll leave him alone. And then Abraham began to bargain. them. Do you think God needed to ask Abraham before he could do that? He's the Almighty. But if he did, he would be going against his own word. Because he did not include himself in the dominion for her. He gave it to man. So there must, there should, there had to be a man who says, God, I agree you should destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but don't do it if there are 50 people right there that are righteous. And they bagged in and bagged in and bagged in and came to 10. If you find 10, would you do it? God said, no. Unfortunately, God couldn't find 10. Lot hasn't been doing a good job. Praise God. But God said, well, I'll let Lot go. Look at it. Any scripture, in any story, whether in the old or in the new, God did nothing except that which he had found in man to agree with him. In fact, the scripture in Amos says, God will not do a thing except that which he has revealed to his servants, the prophet. Did he need the permission of mortal men? Absolutely, yes. Because he keeps to his own word. In fact, in our days, God does not do anything until he finds a man or a woman who will partner with him. Because it is talking about earth. In heaven, God doesn't need to ask you. He just does his stuff. But on earth, he has to come to us. In fact, do you know, God needed a man to agree that Jesus could come and rescue us. And he found that man in Abraham. Would you give me your own precious son? The son that you waited for 25 years to get. The one that I promised you, that I said through him, the whole earth will be blessed. And Abraham obeyed. And when he took it upon himself to give his only begotten son to God, God said, yeah, now I have permission. Let's set it in motion. I'm going to bring Israel to you and through your lineage, that man called Jesus Christ, who is God in mortal flesh, is going to come down and rescue us. If he had done it without Abraham's obedience, he would have, he would have broken his own word. So, 
in everything on earth, God needs the permission or the partnership of you and I, of one man, in order to do it. It sounds heavy, I know, it sounds too deep for some people, but it is the truth of scripture. In fact, in Isaiah it says, I looked for a man who will do what? Stand in the gap. Why, why, why was he looking for a man? Couldn't he just do whatever he wanted to do? He had to, because by his own principle, he had given the authority and the charge of the earth to man. You know, it doesn't matter how powerful the prime minister is, he cannot just come into your house and just do stuff. Even though he is the prime minister of the country, right? But in your house, you have legal, in fact, you will be trespassing. And if he was in Texas, she could shoot him. Yeah, he is the president of the country, but right now he is trespassing on personal property. It doesn't matter whether you are living, whether, who, who, it doesn't matter where you live, as long as it is personal property. Same thing, God gave it to us, but it has become our domain, and God will not trespass. He is too faithful to his word. Therefore, in doing the works that God wants to do on earth, he needs partnership with us. He does. I basically preached last message, last week's message again. But I did that in order to create a foundation upon which I want to build this couple of points. Are you going to fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Because when I hear this word, fellowship with the Spirit, uh, I don't want you to be thinking of some spooky spiritual exercise. Now, I'm talking about partnership, participation with the Spirit of God to bring God's purposes and His will to pass. Amen. He says we should pray like this. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why did God need us to pray like that? Because He does. He needs our permission to do something on earth. To walk on earth. That's why we pray for revival. God could send revival, just send it like that. But he will not. He will be breaking his own word. He needs us to cooperate with him, to cry out to him, to plead with him, to say, let the revival come. And then it comes. Amen. Amen. Am I making sense to anybody? Yes. Let's turn to the book of Romans. Oh, praise God. Please permit the Holy Spirit to speak to you today. Just open your heart. Just open your heart. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be altered. So I begin to think, how do I fellowship with the Holy Spirit? How do I partner with the Holy Spirit? How do I participate with the Holy Spirit in what God wants to do on earth? And I'll give you a couple of points from the scriptures. I may not be able to explain everything in detail, but I'll just give it to you. Just read the scriptures that will be on the screen when you get home and you will get some revelations from there. Number one, the first thing that we must do in order to fellowship, in order to partner, in order to participate with the Holy Spirit is to let Him dwell in our bodies. Do you know that there are many believers who don't want the Holy Spirit to dwell in their bodies? They don't want the Holy Spirit to lead in them. What I mean by that is this. They are born again. The Spirit of God is in them. Because you cannot be born again except that the Spirit of God is in you. But they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. And they don't want it. Amen. The Holy Spirit seeks to dwell in human bodies. So if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, and you've not had any desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are basically refusing to allow the Holy Spirit partner with you. 
Amén. Praise God. And it is the truth. But I can deal with the details of that later. Now, if you begin to look in the Bible, there are a couple of scriptures that just every time I read it are astonishing. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we will read 19 and 20. I want to show you something. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God. The NIV says, Honor God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So God paid a price in order to inhabit your body, to make your body the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you flip back to chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And then it adds, a few scary statements. If anyone defies the temple of God, that is your body, okay, <laughs> God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That scares me. But that's true. It's the truth of God's word. That my body, this clay, dirt, humus, body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you need to treat your body as the house of the Holy Spirit. You need to. You absolutely have to. If you are not, you are not allowing the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the partnership of the Holy Spirit, to progress as it ought. In reading this scripture again, if you actually go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and you start from verse 12, and I, and I want to read that, just permit me this morning. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. So, for those whose bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, they must realize that all things can be lawful for you, but not all things are helpful for the partnership that you're getting into. Amen. Praise God. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now, listen to a couple of these verses. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot or a prostitute if you're reading the NIV? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Everything that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you? Whom you have from God and you are not your own? In meditating on this scripture, two things kind of became evident to me. I realized that it is not when you come to the church and stand before a priest and say a vow in what we call marriage or 
the, the, a wedding ceremony that two flesh becomes one. By scripture, it is not marriage that make two flesh to become one. It is not. Amen. The plain reading of these few verses tells us that when a man goes into a woman in sexual intercourse, that's what makes two flesh become one. Right? Is that clear? Because you're not saying a vow with a halot. You're not like, oh, today I join myself to you. No, you're not saying all that stuff we say here. All the stuff we say here when we conduct a wedding, those are covenants that must be kept. But it is the intercourse after that makes two flesh become one. That's what he says, plainly, right? Yeah. And that was quoted from Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 and Matthew chapter 19 4 to 6 where Jesus said the same thing as well. Now the two shall become one. While they are in church saying their vows and all of that, they haven't become one. <laughs> It is the intercourse afterwards that makes them one. And it needs no prayer. It needs no exchange of vow. Now, what am I saying? What I'm saying is this. For every believer, when you have this understanding, sexual immorality takes a new dimension. Because it is no longer just sin, it is destroying your partnership and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That is why now I know when the Bible says every other sin is without the body. But this one is particularly dangerous because it is with the body. Because now the temple in which the Holy Spirit is so reign supreme is being married to somebody else. So there are many people who have been joined to all kinds of people before they come and say, girl, I'd like to join myself to you. Amen. Therefore, the believer should pray and ask God to separate him or her from whoever else you've been joined to previously. Amen. Amen. You know, when people get saved, we, we tell them to terminate with the past and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, and you're wondering, okay, well, I'm, I'm saved. But the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. It's only God who does put asunder between those two people that have been joined. Oh, praise be to God that we can simply ask him and he will do it. Amen. Any man, any woman can stand and say, Holy Spirit, I want my body to be your temple. I don't want to be joined to all of these other men in my white life. Would you separate me from all of them? I want to be solely yours in this partnership. And just as it is prayed, the Lord does all of the cutting and cleansing and then cleaving. Amen. Is somebody understanding? So people of God, we have to take this seriously. You, you can buy the name of Jesus. I cut myself from Susan. You know, Susan, 10 years ago. Because now I want my body to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And those that have been saved, that have been cleansed, that have been washed, that are now temples of the Holy Spirit, would know that they can stand and declare the Holy Spirit lives in me. He is at work true. So that when sexual immorality presents itself, you know the target of the devil. That is why when the enemy wants to destroy anyone, that is the tool that is used. Because once he is able to end your partnership with the Holy Spirit, there is not much you can do. But again, thanks be to the Lord Jesus because he is able to clean, to cleanse us, to wash us, to make us whole when we come to him. In that place, it says, honor God with your body. 
How do you then honor God with your body? Quickly, number two. By yielding our thongs to the Holy Spirit. To honor the Lord with your body, you let the Holy Spirit dwell in you and feed you. If you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, ask Him to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Because He needs you. He desperately needs you. You keep your body pure and useful to God. That's why the Bible says to flee sin, to flee sexual immorality, to flee this thing so that we can be useful to God. You keep your whole body in check by yielding your thumb to the Holy Spirit. How is that? In James chapter 3 verse 2, he began to tell us that in order to control your body, all the Holy Spirit needs is really your tongue. Amen. Such an amazing revelation. In order for the Holy Spirit to take care and take control and take hold of all of your body, all he needs is your tongue. That's one of the reasons why praying in tongues is so powerful. It is so amazing how these things are. There is some deep things in here that I need to communicate to you. In, in James chapter 2, he, um, in chapter 3, I think, verse 2, he began to say something. He says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put beats in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at sheep, although they are so large and are driven by fierce wings, they are turned by very small ruder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the thong is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest. A little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. The tongue is so set amongst our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. We eat, we bless our God and Father, and we eat, we curse men who have been made in the likeness and the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? First, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Now, Brother James has just told us you can't control your thumb. Now he's telling us not to produce double things with the same thumb. I could have asked him, but you just said no man can control the thumb. So we're all doomed. Why? I mean, like, you just told us that we, can, we cannot control our thumb. So we can't do this. But praise be to God. Because the Holy Spirit was given to us in order to help us yield our body to Him and then He will be in charge. No wonder, no wonder, one of the gifts of the Spirit is that gift of praying in other things. Because when you begin to yield your thumb to the Holy Spirit to pray through, the whole of your body follow. Praise God. Praise God. The whole of your body comes under the control of the Holy Ghost. So number one, I let him dwell in my body. Not only just dwell in my body, I need to yield my thumb to him. 
not just in when I speak, I speak with grace. When I talk to people, I let my words be seasoned with salt. But I also yield my thong to him by praying with the Holy Ghost. So that takes us back to Romans chapter 8. I'm about to close. Verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. The Spirit helps us. Because we are weak, we're feeble, we're not able to do these things, but he helps us. How does he help us? He himself makes intercession to us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He speaks to us when we pray in tongues, when we pray in the Holy Ghost. So, how do I partner with the Holy Spirit? I let him dwell in my body. I seek and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I yield my tongue to him by watching the words that I speak, by speaking with grace. But then, more to it, I pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit wants to use your entire body to do the will of God on earth. He wants to use your hands. He wants to help the poor with your hands. He wants to go places through you. He wants to send you to places where he wants to go. He wants to use your resources. Sister Queen, God bless you. And Mama, Mama D, God bless you. Because the Lord is using your hands to meet the needs of the poor. He wants to do that. You know, last week I was saying, people blame God and say, oh, if there is a God, why is there this? Why is there that? Why is this happening? Why, why are there so many poor people? And I just look at them and look at yourself in the mirror. You are the cause. Because you are the one who has dominion on the earth. You are the one who is to subdue the earth. If you aren't doing it, go and do it. Because it needs your body and your obedience to do it. Amen. If there is poverty in the world, it is the fault of man. That's right. In fact, it is estimated that the 10 richest men in the world can wipe out poverty from the entire planet with the resources that they have. So whose fault is it that there is poverty? God's? Absolutely not. Amen. God wants to preach to others through you. You know, Cornelius needed to be saved, but God couldn't tell him how to be saved by himself. Have you wondered about that? He had to send an angel to go get Peter. Because a man has got to do the job of preaching the gospel to another. Or at least somebody else has to pray so that the person will be saved. He wants to show love to the lost to us. He simply wants to use our bodies, use our hands to heal the sick. That's why we go out door to door. That's why we go out in evangelism. That's why we are asking God, what can you do to me? Everything God has given to you is to partner with him to accomplish his purposes. You think you are smart for your own sake? Absolutely not. Everything that he has given to you, even your beauty, is to partner with him to do that which he wants to do on the earth. But most importantly, the Holy Spirit wants to pray God's will to you. He wants to. He wants to pray the will of God the Father to you. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he is at work in this earth. He wants to use you. He is trapped in you. Amen. And what are you doing with him? Can you imagine when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus? The, all of the Holy Spirit that there could be was trapped in his body. And then if he just sat down in Nazareth and said, I'm doing nothing. and healing the sick and all of that. It would be a great disaster. And that's what we're doing, many of us. We're so born again, so spirit-filled, so tongue-talking. But we're not doing anything for the Lord. If you could do nothing else, 
Let him pray God's will through you. Let him pray God's will through you. Finally, I'll make this point from Romans chapter 6, verse 26. Now it says the Holy Spirit helps our weakness. Now the word translated helps there is not just help. It is joint help in the Greek. It is the assistance afforded by any two persons to each other who mutually bear the same load or carry it between them. You know, if I want to carry something and I call from the UK and I grab one end and he grabs the other end, that is exactly what the word means. Two people carrying a burden. That's what that word means. So when the Bible says the Holy Spirit, likewise, the Holy Spirit helps our weakness. He is saying, you got to bring your tongue, you got to commit the time, and I'll do the speaking. So it has to be two people who are in, that is exactly what fellowship is. That is exactly what partnership and participation with the Holy Ghost is. You both partner together to bring God's will to pass. Do you know that those of us here were enough to change the country? If you would just say, Lord, use us. Lord, birth in me a new zeal to find and to seek you, to let your purposes, your will be done in Canada as it is in heaven. All that you have made up your mind to do in our country, you've already settled it in heaven. I'm going to pray until it comes to pass. And the Lord will do it. Just one man says, give me Scotland, else I die. And God responded just one man said let there be revival in new york and began to pray and god responded no wonder that queen said well i fear that prayer of that man called john knox more than all of the army of scotland because in praying by the spirit God's will is set in motion. Not only is the artillery of heaven behind you, but God himself receives permission to begin to work. And what is it that God cannot do? Let us rise. Let us rise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to plead with you. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, please look for it. Ask for it. Ask somebody to, to, to just pray with you until you receive because you're missing out on that which the Holy Spirit requires to partner with you. And if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and you haven't been praying in tongues, I want to beg you, begin to set, a time, uh, set time aside to do so. To do so. Amen. Let me read to you while you're standing, because when you're standing and I read this to you, you tend to remember that. <laughs> I'm going to read this to you, because I believe it may help somebody. Some of you are in a place where you don't even understand what is going on, what is happening to you. Now, what I'm going to read to you, I wrote around October the 9th, 26, 20, uh, 2006. Yeah, October the 9th, 2006, I had just moved to Norway. And I was meditating on this verse of scripture. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. I said, I didn't know what that was all about. That is Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Until I looked in my study Bible for the meaning of the word infirmities. Then it hit me like a rock. Infirmities was not what I have always thought it was. 
I thought it was being weak, weakness, or just sickness. Because the NIV version calls it weakness. But it truly means feebleness or weakness of mind and body, malady, frailty, diseases, sicknesses, and the result of such weakness or sickness. How does that change anything? I read the verse again. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses and the results of our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit in himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Many times we feel things are not going well. We are not praying enough. We are not studying enough or behaving well enough. We are not getting the results we desire. Or we feel that we are living below some max we have set. Those are not weaknesses. They are the result of our being weak. Or the signs that we are naturally weak. Those are infirmities. And the good thing is, the Holy Spirit helps us with exactly those. Now, I truly know that He has the answers before I even understand the problem. How does He do it? He helps us to pray. He utters the things in our spirit that we cannot give utterance to. We will come into situations when we do not know what to pray for or even wish for. Yet, he helps us. Just like I didn't know how to even pray in the last couple of weeks. Just being dry and out. So how does he help our infirmities? Just how? When we pray in other tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 explains how to do this beautifully. Amen. Verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies, builds up, strengthens, grows up, fortifies himself. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. When you pray in tongues, the spirit prays. And that is how he helps our infirmities. The result of our inherent weakness, our flaws, all the things that seems to go wrong, our shortcomings, and all the rest. Even when it is so hard or so bad, we don't even know what to wish or ask for. Anyway, in simple terms, when I feel the way I feel in the past few weeks, it is as a result of weaknesses in me, in my spirit or in my system. The way to correct that is to pray in tongues. When I sense my shortcomings, and maybe some of you are sensing your shortcomings today. And I have done all that I know to do, like confessing my sins and correcting myself to no avail. <laughs> then I need to pray in the spirit. When life throws things we can hardly understand at us, when problems we can hardly comprehend begin to show up and we have done all to no avail, it is time to go on our knees. A lot of us get to this point that is the point of going on our knees, but then we try to pray our way through and construct the words for ourselves. Meanwhile, we don't even know what to say or pray about properly. I have made those same mistakes several times, but the correct thing to do is get on my knees or on my face or in whatever posture that I need to get on and pray in tongues till there is a building up of my spirit till the spirit has finished saying all the things i cannot order to god on my behalf it may be 30 minutes and maybe one hour it may be two hours or all day long but we must be willing to tarry long enough and just pray in tongues till it has all come out of our spirit at first it may seem dry and shallow it may even seem we're praying out of iniquity to him. But then a tap opens up and the spirit takes over. If we stay in there long enough, just yes. praying yes. in other tongues. Oh, what if I don't understand? 
or comprehend all that I am saying in tongues. Of course, I won't understand. It won't make sense. When you pray in tongues, though it is you who prays, it is actually the Spirit praying and correcting all your infirmities. As stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you won't even understand it. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. How does the Spirit speaks mysteries through him? If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Your understanding will be unfruitful. I love that. How I have struggled with my weaknesses and shortcomings. How I have beat myself with my lack of understanding of what is wrong with me and in me. How I have just stopped. Hey. As life brings all sorts and throws all the challenges at you. As we come into zones we have not been before and our witnesses give us in the thing to do is lock the door from the back just pray in tongues scream shout cry if you like but do it in other tongues till the resistance melts employ the help of the spirit as you get better understanding of the situation you can then also pray in understanding till you feel a victory in the realm of the spirit pray until you feel a victory in the realm of the spirit and then go out there and overcome everything is first spiritual before it is physical quit moosing quit mourning quit i will quit I will just pray in other tongues, whether I feel like it or not, whether it makes sense or not, till the Spirit comes to my rescue. Hallelujah. Could you just close your eyes and pray in other tongues if you could? Thank you, Spirit of the Lord, because indeed you help our infirmities, you help our weaknesses, and even the result of the fact that we are inherently weak. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You've been sent to help our weaknesses, to help us, to help us, to help us. You've been sent to help us, to partner with us, and to bring the will of God to pass on the face of the earth. We will pray in the spirit. We will pray in understanding. We will pray until your will is done. We will cry. We will shout. We will cry. We will shout. We will scream, whether we understand it or not. We will just cry out to you, and you will come true for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, every problem that is not understood in this place, today, by the help of the Spirit, we pull them down in the name of Jesus. Every life that is under a siege, a siege of the enemy, be loosed in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you take hold of us? Take hold of our body. Take hold of us. We give our temples to you. We give our bodies to you. Take a hold of our hands. Take a hold of our mouth. Take a hold of our thoughts. Take a hold of our lives. And begin to do wonders. And begin to do exploits. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory be to your name. 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 Father, in this place this morning, everyone that have been joined to others in the course of their Christian world, we liberate them now. The Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That is, you are able to separate the holy from the common. Everyone here is sanctified unto you. Therefore, Lord, we ask you to separate each one from every strange body that they have been joined to. 
because we need these bodies for your will and for your purpose. We need these temples for the Holy Ghost to dwell in and to do a mighty work in our city. We receive it now because you have done it. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Could you please give God praise one more time? Thank you for his word.